Hello, everybody. My name is Maria Korolov. I'm the editor of Hypergrid Business, and I'm here today to introduce you to a discussion panel about the current state of the hypergrid and possible future developments on the hypergrid. Topics will include issues such as hypergrid user identification, transfer permissions, security, and distributed asset fetching. We have here a panel of core developers, including Intel's Mick Bowman, hypergrid inventor Diva Canto, uh, also known as Crystal Lopez, um, OpenSIM uh, Overt Foundation head Justin Clark Casey, and Avenation founder um, Melanie Millard, also known as Melanie Thielker. Up first is um, Crystal Lopez, who's a professor in the School of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. As I mentioned, she invented the hypergrid, and before that, she worked at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, which you guys may know for having invented the mouse and the graphical user interface. She's the co-inventor of aspect-oriented programming, uh, which is a programming technology featured in the MIT Technology Review. And uh, she also serves on the board of the Overt Foundation with Justin Clark Casey. Um, Krista, thank you very much for speaking. And um, you will be making some remarks about the current state of the hypergrid. Thank you, Maria. If I knew that my bio was going to be repeated so many times, I should have given people a better bio. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just uh, start by making some general comments about the hypergrid because I know that lots of people here are very familiar. In fact, there's lots of people here hypergriding already from other worlds. And uh, for some of you, this is very new and uh, you probably don't know much what the hypergrid is and what it can do. So I thought I would... Um, uh, just give a brief overview about what it is. So what is the hypergrid? Uh, in te technical speech, it's a federation protocol. Okay, I think everybody understands that the concept of a federation. And, uh, these are independent units that decide to uh, cooperate with each other. So that's what it is. Um, even more concretely, it's a set of optional services in OpenSIM that allow you to link your world to other worlds and teleport seamlessly among them. So I can have my own um, virtual world, just like I do. In fact, I am hypergriding here from my server at, uh, at, uh, in a, at UCI. Um, and then, sort of conceptually, what happens if on the left here, this is my world, um, and this is my map over here in my world, I can conceptually place uh, an hyperlink on my map uh, that if I go there, I'm actually teleported to another world. Okay, so conceptually, it's sort of an hyperlink here, a map hyperlink um, to between virtual worlds. Uh, so there are some frequently asked questions. Um, does this work between OpenSIM and Second Life? No. Um, and the reason why it doesn't work is because, sec you know, Linden Lab's not uh, interested. They, they were interested in inter interoperability at some point, but then they laid off everybody and uh, they continued to, the, to do the, the garden wall model, which is fine too. Um, second question, is it sort of uh, mandatory to run the hypergrid when you run OpenSIM? And the answer is no. In fact, the hypergrid is turned off by default. Um, when you install OpenSIM off the box, if you don't do anything, it's not hypergrid enabled. So you actually have to do something to, to run the hypergrid. Uh, another question, with the hypergrid, since you know, you're moving people from one world to another, um, is, uh, can, can just people be impersonated? Can I, you know, somebody send someone here to this environment saying that they are Justin? And they're actually not Justin. There's some impersonator doing pretending to be Justin. And the, the answer is no, this is not possible. Uh, the identity is verified. And in fact, that was work that happened at some point early on. Uh, so the hypergrid is my inventory protected? Uh, yes, right now. Uh, only items under my suitcase, which is a special folder in our inventory, only those items are exposed to the internet. If your um, virtual world operator um, uh, does the right thing, uh, they should protect all of their ser internal services on the, on the firewall, behind the firewall, and the only things that are outside the firewall are things that are exposed on the My Suitcase folder. Uh, 
So the next question is uh, the assets. Okay, so if inventory is protected, how about general grid assets? Are they protected? The answer is no, not yet. There are some protections in place. There's things that you can say that the, the virtual world operator can say that, for example, scripts can never be accessed. Uh, but but the mechanism for doing this is still not very expressive. So we are g working on on this is one of the things that we're probably going to talk a lot here on this panel. So uh, the assets are still not completely protected. Uh, and so that we just have an idea, this may be a bit technical, but I think everybody will understand. If a virtual world is something here inside the blue box, um, the, the blue box means that everything is protected inside the firewall. So all the assets, inventory is all protected, and these are all for internal use of the virtual world, so the virtual world as a walled garden. What the hypergrid does is to place these green boxes, which are extra services that are exposed on the internet, and uh, what is, these are additional services. They don't interfere with, with the internal ones. They use the internal ones, but they don't change what the internal ones do. They do something different. They do something with a lot more security in them because they are exposed on the internet. So that's that's the idea, and sort of in a bird's eye view, what we, we end up having is this federation of the virtual worlds, uh, in which you have many of these, and uh, it's the green boxes that, that talk to each other in, according to this hypergrid protocol. Um, so that's that's about it, and it's just a little bit of history. Um, the hypergrid 1.0 was the first one that I talked uh, that I that I. Uh, worked on. It was just an exploratory study to, to basically trick the viewer to do it. Uh, I had no idea if the viewer could actually do it and there was no security whatsoever. Security was not a concern. Feasibility was the concern and understanding how the, the viewer, you know, how we could push the viewer to to, to work beyond its original design. Uh, then it was pretty clear that uh, one of the very first things that needed to happen was identity protection because, you know, if we didn't do anything, then impersonations could occur. So that was the very first thing that I addressed with identity protection. Um, uh, better security inventory in, in that uh, intermediate 1.5 uh, version. The current version is 2.0 and we have, again, identity protection. This inventory now is finally completely secure except for the suitcase folder. Uh, we have some um, access control policies for users, so you can say, if you're a virtual world operator, you can say, oh, oh I can only get users from certain origins, or I, or I don't want to have users from that origin because they are griefers or something like that. So you, there's that already in place. And there's the beginning of access control for assets, but as I said, that's work that's going to happen uh, in the future. Okay, and this is my uh, opening statement, just to give a little overview of, of what the hypergrid is and where we are. And I'll let my fellow panelists um, talk. Uh, thank you, Krista. Thank you very much for our presentation. Uh, next up, we have Mick Bowman, uh, who's, who's from Linden Labs, and he leads their virtual world infrastructure research project. And his team develops technologies that enable order of magnitude scalability improvements and virtual environments, opening the door to new levels of immersiveness and interaction players. You may know him best as one of the people behind the distributed scene graph, which allows up to a thousand avatars or more on a single open sim region. Uh, Mick, can you um, can you do your opening statement, please? Sure. Um, and I didn't realize I'd changed companies recently, but I better not tell my boss that. Um, Did I not say Intel? <laughs> no, you said Linden. <laughs> 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 oh, <my God. laughs> uh, I'd go on sabbatical and come back for a different company. That'd be really interesting. Hmm. Linden, I mean Intel lab. <laughs> I said it again. It, it's, let's, uh, let's say it again, finally. Intel Labs. <laughs> great. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. So, um, you know, we started a little bit of this conversation this morning in, in the first keynote session about, about um, grids and hypergrids. And um, one of the things I just wanted to start talking about for a minute here is what is a grid? Um, uh, we sort of think of it right now as um, a set of simulators that, that create some space. Um, there's usually a set of services where we have uh, assets stored and inventory, um, user accounts and other things like that. And, and kind of more broadly than that, it's, it's kind of a community. It's a set of people who interact with one another. 
that way. Um, and the basic premise behind this is that there's a set of these sort of independent communities, um, and each one of them is very large, and there's a relatively small number of them. Um, what hypergrid does is it really changes all of the rules. That if we go back and take a look at, you know, for example, community, the community that we have here in this conference is not made up of people from a grid. It's made up of people who have a shared interest. Um, when we see education things, uh, sites and applications starting to appear, um, it's people who share a common interest, not necessarily share a common grid. Um, if you look at the people who are in Moses, it's not from a single company. Um, it's people who have a common interest in the, the training and simulation spaces that way. The communities that we have, um, and we participate in many of them, are not tied to the grids, are tied to our interests and the social relationships that we have. One of the things that Hypergrid does is allow us to have those communities across um, multiple grids. The second thing, um, as far as grids go, is this kind of core set of services. Um, we store assets in a location, we have inventory in a location, we have some sense of login and authentication that way. But again, what Hypergrid does is allow us to break that tight um, binding between our avatar and that set of services. Um, the fact that my inventory and assets are principally stored at OS Grid does not prevent me from moving around from grid to grid using the Hypergrid. And so that set of, of core services um, that we would normally have associated with a grid um, really doesn't define in the grid either. Um, and in fact, grids are really what it comes back to just space. Um, that each grid is a set of applications, a set of simulations run in a certain space. And what Hypergrid allows us to do is to separate our identity and our inventory and our asset management almost completely from the space in which we're operating. It separates us completely from the set of people so that we can, can interact with a much broader, uh, broader community that way. Um, so really, what a grid is, is space. What a hypergrid is, is all of those other things, all of the, the things that are associated with me as an individual. One of the things I'll talk about tomorrow in the Simeon presentation, this is just a little um, uh, uh, advertisement for it, um, is how to um, actually do an implementation that separates out that set of core services uh, intentionally and architecturally from uh, the simulation uh, and map management pieces of it. So again, what, what Hypergrid and, and the real core for me principle behind Hypergrid is that it separates space from the rest of the things that give me an online presence in virtual worlds. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Justin Clark Casey, the president of the Overt Foundation that oversees OpenSim development. Uh, he's one of the core contributors of, uh, to Open Simulator, uh, core developer, and he works on areas ranging from assets and inventory to performance and infrastructure issues. He's created some of the things we love most about OpenSim, including the ORs, OR files, where you can save an entire region to, to an OR file, and IAR exports, where you can save an inventory or an inventory folder. And uh, th these are things that are unique to OpenSim, um, and they're one of the benefits of OpenSim. He also provides Open Simulator related consulting services, and, and and he's one of my favorite developers. He always answers his emails immediately, no matter how uh -huh. dumb my questions. And I have some really dumb questions. So, uh, uh, Justin, your opening statement. Right. I, I do want to be clear. That was a, a very nice introduction, um, Maria. But I, I do I do want to be clear that. that Overt uh, acts really as um, as a contain uh, acts to resolve some of the licensing issues and IP issues and and may become an organisation for helping promote Open Sim in the future. But the the actual project itself is controlled by Open Open Simulator controls Open Simulator. The technical decisions and all this stuff is, is remains with the core developers. So I just want to be absolutely clear about that because that is the question people ask sometimes. So about the um, 
about hybrid. So I'm so let me actually stay on this side. I've, for some reason, I put myself as chairman of Over. I keep forgetting what I actually am. Um, so I don't actually. A lot of my work is done on the core simulator itself, uh, mainly because that is kind of the way. Uh, I do do consulting, and that's the way I continue to do consulting, because for that to happen, things have to work. We have to actually have software that's valuable. So I tend to work a lot on the core simulation aspects of it, and open hypergrid. But I do, uh, I think, as I said earlier today, I do find hypergrid extremely interesting. Um, and, and really, uh, kind of just go through this slide. So yeah, I mean, I think isolated open simulator, by that I mean, an open sim instance that stands on its own, whether it's a standard or whether it's, or whether it's a grid, say running in a school or running as a kind of a, a social grid or whatever, is a valuable thing. I mean, you have a lot of features you don't find elsewhere, like a lot of the interactive building, for instance. You do see that in things like Minecraft, but it's not a particularly common thing as of yet. And you do get a lot of social features. So, for instance, um, I think on, on the Moses grid, when people are uh, trying, trying to do mass role playing, that's, that's very interesting because you do get, there are kind of in baked in systems for communication in place, which aren't necessarily there for, uh, you know, games which don't handle the, the same number of, um, of users as of yet. But I also think that OpenSim can, can never be as good as a game engine. Um, there's a lot of legacy craft in the protocol um, because Second Life has evolved. I mean, Second Life, because we do owe, as I said earlier, we, a lot of, us, of what we do is taken from SL, from Linden Lab. And they've evolved a code base over a very long period of time and when you do that you do tend to get a lot of um a lot of kind of oddities and a lot of kind of evolved systems that you, we should never do if you're doing the same thing from scratch so i do think that i if OpenSim would just kept isolated on itself just as a kind of a standalone thing it can and will be overtaken by something sooner or later some other either another proprietary product or even another open source project will come along and be able to do something better and you know, OpenSim will become another project, which is which is fine. I mean, that's not that unusual. But I think the interesting thing about the hypergrid is that it does potentially allow a different kind of model, um, something that is more web-like rather than a single instance of a virtual world. Instead, you know, as I said earlier, people can move content and identity between independent worlds. They're not. There's no single point of control or single company in charge, which is the gatekeeper of what you can and can't do. Instead, anybody can kind of come on and do any, anything. I'm, yeah, that's, a, that's an extreme, and you, you do have to obey protocols, which is where they become immensely important. But there's a potential for uh, kind of a multi-source innovation. Anybody can really do these things. And the question is, you know, can that avoid the kind of cycle you see of a lot of multi-user systems or multi-user games where there's a there's a strong period of growth at the beginning and then they kind of hit a peak and other better things come along or interest users lose interest and they slow they enter a very long kind of period of 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 survival but it's kind of a slow decline you see it with with games like autumn online everquest the early mmos and and maybe arguably you see it with linden lab second life now where there's been a peak and there's just kind of a continuous slow decline so the question is by by being more web like can you kind of get it can you can you survive that can you do something different and does the enabling a kind of common content an arguably culture with common protocols allow you to um allow you to produce something allow you to get that network effect of where every single simulator or grid that joins the system both gains a, a benefit from everybody already there and, and also benefits everybody already in the system and so you get a, a virtuous cycle of growth Oh, blank slide. How did that get in there? Uh, sorry, I, I produced these a little bit in a rush. OK. As soon as this is going to res in. OK, good. Um, so yeah, uh, actually, oh, the other slide had a load of text in it. Never mind. OK, I might extemporize slightly. So, so I think there were kind of uh, a number of challenges to to this kind of thing so really okay so one of the difficulties is um is bugs i mean i'm sure uh crystal won't mind me saying that uh, you know this is pretty fresh code and it relies on an awful lot of things to go right and so it is po quite possible for bugs to enter the system we all know that hypergrid is, is far from perfect um, I open sim itself is far from perfect. We, I mean, we've seen issues even preparing for this conference issues with with, with permissions and bringing stuff over and that kind of thing and, and to a large extent I think that's kind of inevitable at the moment. 
we're kind of trying to, or rather Christus for the main part, is, is squeezing these things into a second life protocol, which is never designed for this kind of stuff. I mean, we see it with things like, like for instance, um, the caching of, uh, of bindings between usernames and, and their identity. The, the, the viewer by, by default just takes these things at once. If you, we've seen it, if anybody's seen the un, unknown user bug, where we kind of give the give a particular you you are the binding to unknown user you MMT gun eight at the moment. People might think I'm speaking gibberish and to a little bit I am. But that binding persists forever. There's no there's no idea that well one, one system might give you the wrong binding, so you've got to ignore that and look for the binding later on. And in, instead one system effectively can pollute the well for everybody, which is not a particularly good thing. So we're kind of vulnerable on those kind of side and and the hypergrid itself does rest on a lot of protocols within OpenSim as well, which are kind of been evolved as well. So things like the the way that scene objects are transmitted, all the data there. We, I mean, we've kind of effectively tried to get around these things by by having more dynamic attributes or being able to put in attributes and and not have them upset other readers of the same XML if they don't recognize them. But there is this thing where it rests on a lot of protocols which are not documented and, and sometimes have big idiosyncrasies. And one has to be constantly aware of security issues with Hypergrid, because um, it is something, I mean, Chris is, is of course doing a, a very good job on that, but it's the kind of thing you continually have to think about. That's a very bit in general, but with Hypergrid, you know, there are these questions of of not exposing content you don't want exposed and all those kinds of issues. And also at the moment, the the system we have, the federated system we have, I'm not a big fan of because it does allow the backend servers a lot of control. It's not, in a way, it's not like the web because if you've ever teleported to a simulator which isn't working very well, that simulator can kind of trap you there. You can't get out of it because to actually teleport to another location, which is analogous to going to a different website, you actually have to have the cooperation of the website you're leaving, which is which is kind of bizarre in web terms, but. In what we have at the moment, that, that's true. The only way to get out that's to relog, which isn't exactly an elegant solution. So I guess the challenge to, to me is, and sorry, I'm taking a bit of time here, is um, is a web-like approach viable? Because um, I, I think virtual world development is much more complex than the web. OpenSim itself has a built-in web server inside it, so you're already kind of layering a huge amount more on top of that. And there's a greater room, I think, compared to the web for different kind of approaches to things. I mean, Second Life has a very kind of stereotyped graphical approach, whereas you can imagine, I mean, there's huge numbers of games and other systems out there which take kind of different approaches to things. And I didn't do a lot on the viewer side, so I don't know if that's, um, I don't know how relevant that is, but it is vastly more complicated. Okay, it looks like, I don't know whether we've lost voice or not. Um, so I guess the question is, kind of web-like overcome a silo? It's about culture and content, about distributed innovation, open research and collaboration, as we've seen with uh, things like all these companies and individuals coming together. And I think innovative multi-grid services, like some of the things we've been seeing in this conference, like marketplaces, maybe profiles, which, um, which can be accessed anywhere um, and between multiple grids, and things like asset and inventory storage. And I think some of those things might even be more centralized. I can imagine, you know, if there's one, one, one place to go for profiles, for instance, and that, you know, without a federated system, that's a more viable thing for just one single centralized system, much as people don't always like that approach. So anyway, that's all I wanted to say in my opening statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Justin. And our last uh, panelist today is Melanie Filker, the founder of Evanation Grid, one of the largest commercial open sim grids and a core developer. Uh, they've contributed a, lo a lot of interesting code to OpenSim, most recently um, for export permissions. A very, uh, so I'm very interested in what's going to happen in here. Um, she's a long-term Second Life resident, um, has a lot of experience in using virtual worlds, um, and uh, she's there's uh, there are up to 12 developers working for the last two years on her team. So, uh, Melanie. Um, if you'd like to make uh, your statement. Thank you, Maria. Well, um, you've already um, mentioned it, the export permission, uh, whereas um, it's definitely um, also to my direction to think about getting more web-like and um, having a um, means to have a transient presence uh, for viewing only and consuming information. Obviously, the export permission is a vital uh, part that is needed for those parts of the uh, metaverse that need to remain grid-like. The main thing that we have to deal with at this moment is inventory and assets 
those are uh, the points that uh, in the protocol as well as in the implementation still have uh, things that one could uh, loosely term security holes. There's currently no way to indicate with a um, more than uh, very coarse granularity what one um, is allowing to be done with one's work. There is um, no way to um, definitely state where one's work can be taken and where not. The export permission certainly is one step in the right direction there. Um, it's something that we have been developing in cooperation with the Singularity Viewer team. Um, with members of the Singularity team um, helping it along on the viewer side and us implementing the server side and um, sending that to core. Inventory is a difficult topic at the best of times and permissions even more so. If you have noticed the um, banging of Fleep's head against the wall when permissions were mentioned, then uh, you know what I'm talking about. They are difficult. They are extremely difficult. And Second Life didn't make them any easier. Linton Labs, rather. The protocol implementation of permissions and the systems that um, work with permissions are definitely and completely geared towards a closed virtual world, a single closed virtual world, a walled garden. We cannot um, easily transport uh, these permission, this permission scheme to the hypergrid. So new ways need to be uh, found and the um, export flag certainly is the first of them. It's not going to remain the only one. Um, Divas mentioned the export uh, or rather um, access permissions that are going to be implemented on the protocol level to make the hypergrid secure. Just to sum it up at the moment, People believe that once you are connected to the hypergrid, basically every content that you have can be taken. Is this true? Yes, at the moment it is unfortunately true. Whereas it's not easily possible to access anything outside the suitcase of the traveler. The traveler themselves can place anything in the suitcase, take it with them, and as soon as they take it with them, it's effectively fair game. Unfortunately, not all people are honest. The microeconomy that's been driving virtual worlds for the last decade has been a, a blessing and it also has been a curse. Because of the uh, microeconomy that deals with um, virtual currency in uh, very, very small denominations, it, it is not really practical to um, start a real-life lawsuit over the infringement of, of virtual content other than the um, real internet, the 2D internet, that we, what I call the flat web, where um, lawsuits are definitely practical and are definitely happening, the virtual worlds do not currently um, enjoy that protection. So um, because of that, copying is rife. It's uh, wholesale, it's everywhere, and um, technical means are helping a little bit to at least curb the casual copying of people who don't even know that they're infringing a copyright. The export permission is a strong statement because when it is made, when this statement is made, the export permission is set, it unequivocally states, I want this item to be available to everyone. I want this to be open. I want this to be content licensed under a permission license that everybody can take and use as they see fit without any borders. This is the traveling kind of content that the hypergrid is going to need. There is a lot of it already. All we need to do is finish the work and flag it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. Now, we've had uh, some questions coming in from the audience, both here in World and through the streaming chat. Um, one question is about uh, the barriers that the legacy viewer presents to the hypergrid protocol design and whether having a branched off open sim only viewer will improve hypergrid travel um, ability for the users. Would somebody like to ta tackle that? I can do it. I can try. Oh, thank you, Krista. Well, um, you're the best. So, you know, when uh, I when I started exploring doing the upgrade in the beginning, um, and when I came to the conclusion that indeed the viewer could be coerced to do something that it had not been designed to do, I thought about different possibilities for how to how to manage all of these all of these things, in particular identity. Um, 
So one one different possibility that that's not what the hypergrid does is that uh, the identity would be completely done on the client side. So it's the user's software, so the viewer, that knows who the person is and that um, you know decides where to go and uh, uh, so more like a um, uh, you know sort of like sort of like the web, although actually. I don't agree with what Justin had said. In fact, uh, if well, the web's not prepared for single sign-ons, and when we have single sign-ons, that's a whole other issue. Uh, but so, but there, there, there is in fact an architecture where there, it's the it's the client component that does uh, identity management. And I, I actually prototyped something along those lines. I, I didn't change the viewer because I didn't uh, want to look in yet another monster pieces of code. What I did do though was a, an experiment that I called grid, um, what was it called, Gridder, Gridder, yes. It was based on, on a, a, a LibOMV, the grid proxy um, uh, software. So I just did a wrapper around the viewer that uh, it, it was that wrapper that basically controlled the, the, the teleports and uh, identity and all that stuff. So it's possible to do that. I, I did it and it, it worked. Um, I, I sort of stopped because, uh, um, you know, we would have to go and change the viewers substantially. I mean, I mean substantially. I, had, I was really doing that wrapper around it and that wrapper would have to be integrated in the viewer itself. So, so I, I, you know, it, although it was possible, it, it was a really bad idea to go at the time because it, it would just not, you know, it would take me forever to integrate that in the viewer. People would not use the viewer. The, the, that would be different from the, the official in the live viewer. So it's strategically, uh, it seemed like a really bad idea. Technically, it's a, it's a possibility. Um, now, there is, there is a more subtle question here about who owns the identity. That's a technical question, a social question, a philosophical question. It's, 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 the, it's the interesting question, like who owns your, the, your online identity? Uh, you know, who owns your Gmail identity, right? Is it you or is it Google? So, so it, it, right now, the way that the internet is taking shape is that uh, the, the service providers uh, basically own everything that you do with them. Uh, and if they, if they suddenly go out of business, you go out of your identity. Uh, that's sort of how it works. So, so the, the hypergrid right now is also doing that sort of thing. So it's the server side that, in a way, owns and controls the person's identity. It's not the client side. Um, now, there, there's a, a possibility of having these personal nodes on the cloud. You don't need to sign up with a, you know, a, a, a grid operator to have your identity. You can boot up your own OpenSIM instance, uh, even in your own machine at, at home, and operate from there. And, and you have virtually your own service provider yourself from your computer. So that's sort of how, how I, I envision that, you know, doing client side identity management also opens up a whole can of worms because, you know, people don't use the same computer, for example, they switch computers when they travel, they, their computer dies, they lose everything in it. So things are moving more into the cloud in many ways. So it, it's, it's a very deep issue here about who owns um, identity and assets and uh, it's an interesting one. So there are many options indeed. I decided to go with one particular one, which is the, the server owns things, the service owns the identity and the assets. And, uh, and so that's, it's possible doing it both ways. Okay, be, here's a... May I, sorry, may I say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I, I think you're right. I've, I mean, pr the pragmatic part of me says that um, with regards to this, people will be lazy if you like and I don't mean that in a bad way I myself am, am very lazy and I think if somebody will manage all that data for them even if it's something as which might be as strong as their own kind of identity then that's what will happen it'll be more efficient for somebody else to manage it for you and and um and maybe they'll advertise to you which is the classic web model I guess but I think that's the way it will go I I, I think what and I think on the broader point I don't know I, I think I think it's very difficult to, to even even now, I, I mean, I think there will come a point, but I think it's difficult to, certainly for somebody like me, to split away from Second Life because that's where, because all this stuff is very experimental, right? I mean, this is all almost kind of research stuff um, to me. The kind of stuff that you can actually do, um, actually have to maintain um, 
kind of a business and maintain being able to actually consult and sell something is stuff that has to work. And that's kind of the stuff we have today, which is the stuff that comes from Linda Lab, effectively, to, for, to a large extent. I know not all of it does, but that's still the case to a large extent. So, so actually splitting away from that and going off on your own is, I think, a very difficult thing at this point. I think it, there has to be a point where there's a lot more um, third party development, effectively, one way or another before that can happen. Um, I have a follow-up question on this. Since we are already seeing OpenSIM only viewers because of the Havoc pathfinding code, like the latest Firestorm release, are we ever going to get the 4096 issue fixed, where you can't teleport more than 4096 regions in any direction? <laughs> Isn't it going to be a panel for viewer developers? Or <laughs> did it happen already? That's a viewer bug. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yep, yes it is, but I, I, I believe it's actually got something to do with type width, so it's not easy. Yeah, no, I've never got a clear answer out of anybody on this, but I, I, that's what I suspect as well. It's something to do with protocol and, and some, some bit limit. It's not going to be probably good. packing something somewhere. Yeah. Pack. Um, another question is uh, what do people think, what do our panelists think is the best way? or steps needed to increase hypergrid adoption. Um, I've been, and I can say I've been tracking these statistics and the number of users of the hypergrid. I mean, uh, among ourselves, I mean, everybody we know travels to hypergrid, but in the general population of some users, many, many don't even realize that it's there and how it works. Well, I find actually with questions that users ask me that they are very much aware of how it works, but I also get people who are telling me, uh, if you're turning on hypergrid, I'm leaving and I want all my t content taken down because everybody still believes that the hypergrid is, is the open door to theft. So um, what's needed in the user's perception is to um, have a uh, sense of security that is provable by code, by audits, so that we can actually say, yes, your content is secure in a hypergrid environment. I agree with Melanie. Basically, it's, it's uh, you know, the missing security for assets that uh, we just haven't gotten to do it yet. And well, it's, uh, it starts with, it's, a, it starts right, with the... Not with just enabling assets, Melanie's, actually, what Melanie's not just saying, assets. yeah. As I say, what uh, Melanie's it's, saying it's is more inventory. than just access. If you're put, if you're putting something in your suitcase that you're not allowed to put in your suitcase, it becomes exposed to the wide internet, and anybody who's a black hat can just grab it out of your suitcase. The right, point so is that at the at the at the point of origin, there need to be controls that allow to set not only whether something can leave the grid. That's an important first step, but uh, effectively, everything needs to have an access list that specifies exactly which grids it can be taken to. Yep. Yeah, so exactly. This brings up one thing that I was that I wanted to, to comment on on this, which is um, when, when we're talking about a relatively small number of grids and, and hypergridding is still very small, relatively speaking, um, it's pretty easy to kind of understand the relationships between the grids. At some point, um, as the numbers of these separate um, kind of identity services to use to use Krista's concept here um, becomes more and more prevalent. Um, now we have this this how do we represent the trust relationship that we have between these different providers? Um, so you know we talk about technically things can be validated um, that we can identify we can author or we we can verifiably identify a person who came from a grid. But why do we necessarily trust the person who's coming from that grid? Um, and so, uh, kind of understanding all of these relationships is um, is something that's critical. The flip side of that is um, maybe what we need is not to figure out how to lock down the content and lock down um, identity. Maybe a better thing is to figure out how to express um, uh, new business models and new content sharing models. Um, that are more appropriate for the kinds of things that we see here. Um. I don't really believe that's going to happen anytime soon, to be honest, because um, right now, as I said, I called it a, a blessing and a curse. It's, it's the micropayment economy. It requires the make once sell many model because the individual item is priced so low that there's no way to amortize the um, 
time that goes into the production of the item from just a few sales. Unfortunately, as I also said, people are not generally honest. Many people are not. There are so many black hats among us that I should have to think of it. So um, any, co any co kind of protection that relies not on technologically locking down something, but rather on um, specifying an intent or having an alternate model, but that can be subverted by people to get something for nothing, will be subverted by people who get something for nothing. And with micropayment amounts, the avenue of a lawsuit is not open. There may at some point be an arbitration or a court system that allows actual um, recourse to um, such means for content creators who have been infringed. But until that's there, I don't think any other model is viable. Now, okay, we don't all believe in technical DRM. I think there's many people, uh, us developers for sure, who know how to circumvent most technological DRM. But the thing that is most worrying is not the actual black hatting. It's what I call ca casual copying. It means somebody sees something, they, they like it, they copy it. They're not aware that they're infringing. They use the item instead of paying for it and using it after. And they are not even aware that they're doing something wrong. We have many people who have come into our grid at uh, one point. They came in, they um, spent $4 on currency, they uploaded their copy botted skin and they wore it. I asked why they did that, asked why uh, they would upload copy botted items. They said it's not copy botted, I bought it in SL. So there. Right. Um, a question about um, interoperability. Uh, so you've talked about the open sim. Um, uh, the, the open sim situation where the hypergrid connects to different open sim grids, um, but there's other types of virtual worlds out there and um, other groups working on more general virtual world interoperability standards. How does fi hypergrid fit in with those? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So you know, just because you know, we are just a bunch of very independent explorers here in the project and um, I don't know, speaking for myself, um, how, can I, how can I put this nicely? Don't I, put it I, nicely, I, just, <laughs> just say I, it. I, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I am in a point of my life that, that I just um, um, decided that I just spend my time on things that I really give me some sort of pleasure <laughs> so so um, participating in in standards meetings I, I totally you know rationally understand that it's very important and it should happen it's that's something that I just cannot myself to so, force to do so one of the things Krista though that that I think and 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 again you've made incredible contributions here is to just move forward um, it's much easier. If, I mean, you and I were both a part of those, um, you know, Linden Lab sponsored um, interoperability discussions, and and everybody brought um, a bunch of of kind of concrete expectations and business models and other things into it. Um, and there was this approach of let's build a standard and then see what we can actually do. Um, and the approach you've taken here, which is which is allows us to actually make progress is let's go build something and then we'll figure out what worked. Um, you know, let's test it by code and then standardize what works rather than trying to build a standard that none of us can implement. And I think that that approach that you've taken is really why we've been able to make as much progress as we have. So, you know, I'll publicly say thank you for what you've done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I will go on about standards and, and, and protocols being eventually essential, but I very strongly believe that they can only come out of working code and demonstrable useful things. They, you, you can't sit down and say, oh, I'm going to create a virtual world from scratch and create this specification with huge, a million holes in it because we don't actually have something real to implement and then throw it over the wall and say, hey, isn't this this great specification? It's all implement. And that's never, ever going to work. And I, don't, I can't get why... Yeah, people who try it don't just don't know how to me just don't know how it goes they don't know how this stuff works so you know i think actually and that's what's enormously interesting about this community is that we actually have something that people are using and can actually get to work in various situations and that, that's you know and to actually get that kind of feedback 
and that's something very rare. And I think it's easier almost, even though OpenSim is really imperfect and does have, I know I keep saying this and people don't always, it has a lot of bugs. There's a lot of issues, right? But actually having something that people are using and working, I think, and actually has kind of a culture is, is something you can actually go places with rather than trying to start something completely from scratch, which is might on paper be better and more perfect, but it also it requires an enormous investment. As you said earlier today, I mean, there's always be already $10 million or something worth of investment in open sim. Um, so, you know, it's very difficult to replicate that and the community as well. So, you know, I think these things have to fall out of working code, not the other way around. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, Melanie, uh, w with the export permission um, getting put into place and support from the Singularity Viewer, uh, you, commercial grids will now be able to say that their content stays on their on their grids if the creators so wish. Uh, will Avination be opening up uh, hypergrid connectivity anytime soon? Avination is not going to do that until the uh, hypergrid is fully secure and uh, people's perception of that is in place because um, right now uh, there's unfortunately too much uh, to lose and not enough to gain. So we need to work on security and we also need to at the same time work on public perception then um, when our users feel secure and feel that their content is secure then uh, we will do that but only then. And what pieces are missing? Uh, what's missing is that it's still possible to uh, take something out of the grid and um, by just putting it into the suitcase. You can take it um, to where it's accessible. You can um, take it to a grid where you can uh, easily circumvent uh, the DRM controls like OS Grid and just um, spin off as many copies as you like. It's not, it's not secure yet. Currently, Avivination would have to open up a significant portion of its assets to the internet in order to enable hypergrid. The, so the export permission doesn't prevent people from putting things into the suitcase? Um, currently not. That would need viewer side code that's not in place yet. And um, People can have different we, viewers. We could use, uh, somebody could use a different viewer exactly to put the item into the suitcase anyway. There are lot of, lots of things that still need to be addressed. We've made a good start, but we're not quite there. Okay. Um, uh, how important uh, do people think the hypergrid is to the whole idea of our virtual world metaverse future, say one where we're all wearing those Oculus Rift headsets and, and living in a matrix like virtual reality, do you see the open sim and the hypergrid as playing a central role in that? I do. I definitely do see that it's uh, going that way. And uh, yes, the virtual worlds with Oculus Rift and us all meeting in virtual space, it's a great vision. I mean, um, I definitely would like to see that happening with Open Simulator. It's uh, definitely uh, the direction to move forward in. Uh, the grids as we have them today certainly have limited shelf life. Um, what about everybody else? Well, if I, <clears throat> so I, you know, I started doing the upper grid, but uh, I actually am very agnostic about it. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's uses for it and there's uses that don't require it for virtual environments. For some certain applications, some virtual environments, um, you know, they don't need to be connected at all. They just are standalone virtual environments that are done for certain specific purposes and they're not social environments. Um, you know, things like I'm also involved in, <clears throat> tools for urban planning and uh, and those tools tend to be very sort of standalone-ish kinds of tools uh, and that's 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 how it is so you know it doesn't make sense to connect those environments to, to the rest of a social world because that's not what they're there to do so so there's a there's a place for everything I mean for social environments I can totally see how you know a federation of some sort uh, is is a good thing because you you escape the the sort of the dominance of of certain players, um, and uh, and you basically decentralize authority all over all over the little place, and that's a good thing for social for social environments. Um, so so yeah, but but that doesn't mean that that's all that the 
platform is good for. There's lots of other applications that are not social. I think I think one can drive the other, as as we've seen with the web, where you know it has been very driven by the wider internet, but you also get things like intranets and and things where where the same tools are used privately. I think one can drive the other. Uh, I mean, personally, sorry for leaping in here. I mean, I'm on the broader question. I I don't know. I mean. I think I think I mean I I think there's some really interesting ideas and, and, and approaches, but I think we have to remember that well we, well we don't. But I I always like to remember that we're a niche of a niche of a niche almost. I mean, Second Life is not a really huge presence out there. OpenSim is another subset of that, and then the Hypergrid is also yet another subset of that. So, you know, we can't get it too overblown with this kind of stuff. I think it's just trying to trying to work out what's useful and, and steadily go forward on that. And, and I think other environments, I mean, this is not, to me, this is not going to be the thing that takes over the whole net or anything like that, right? I mean, this is a particular kind of environment. I think there's some very interesting things when you do, do things in a much more distributed manner, but I think other systems are always going to exist alongside it. But maybe, maybe that's looking too far in the future. I, I, I can't really look that far, but I think, you know, there are so many different kinds of 3D systems and games out there that I don't know if you'd really go to that extreme or whether, or if people want to. I think it remains to be seen. Um, and we have one last question. Um, when, you, when you guys are rolling out and adding these new security measures to OpenSIM, Will individual grids be able to opt in and out of these security measures depending on their particular needs and interests? Yes, I of course. I certainly hope so. <laughs> yes. I mean, OpenSIM is the, you know, configuration paradise or hell. Paradise uh, is one word for it, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> Not the one I would use. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is configurable. So, yeah, we would never make anything mandatory, nothing like that. If there isn't an option for anything in OpenSIM that you're aware of, let us know, we'll put it in. Yeah, exactly. Amen. Oh, never seen an option we didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and uh, by the way, yes. just, just one, one last comment on that. And, and that, that configurability really is a reflection of the OpenSIM community as well. And that is yeah. one of the great things and strengths of our community is um, rather than enforcing a particular set of policies on our users, we give them an awful lot of opportunity to, to make those decisions. And, you know, Maria can have, or excuse me, uh, Melanie can have her <laughs> closed grid as my turn. Uh, Melanie can have her closed grid. Um, and limit the access to the assets, and the OS grid people can have something that's completely open, and it's all part of the same basic platform. Evil people say that we give them enough rope. And we've also been getting some questions coming in from uh, the EU stream. Um, people want to know if, if there's any way to have automatic indexing, like a DNS system, for hypergrid addresses. And we've been discussing this in the local chat as well. Or right now, it's can be can be difficult to find new hypergrid destinations. I'm sure an option for that can be added to have the gatekeeper advertise in a defined protocol so that they can be queried and they can be centrally stored somewhere. Yeah. We love options. It's a mere <laughs> matter, mere matter of programming. Yeah, and configuration. We have so many configuration options, not all of them even work anymore. We don't know how to interact. And, ah. oh, come on, we removed some of the dead ones the other day. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and we, we, are, we are past our time limit, and there's some social events going on this afternoon. Um, some open houses um, from uh, a number of different uh, places. I believe Avanation has uh, an event uh, today. Melanie, yes, is that that's correct? correct. We've got a um, DJ event for the next hour, and then after that, we have a live artist. And during all that time, uh, there's going to be staff there to answer the questions and help people along. Uh, there's also an Air Force. That's happening on the Expo 6. There's also an Air Force Research Lab, Discovery Lab, open house. Um, in the evening tonight, there's going to be a community dance um, on uh, Littlefield Grid. And there's also uh, an event right now on the Metropolis uh, grid going on um, to celebrate diversity. And you can get all the all the details are at on the schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. 
thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you, Krista. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Justin. Um, and thank you, the guy from Linden Lab. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Maria. Thanks, Maria. And thanks for the laughs. Thank you. And um, uh, if anybody has follow-up questions, uh, you can email me. And um, uh, many of the panelists have their email addresses up places as well. Or maybe they will type it into a local chat. And we, we are, our panel is closed for the day. Thank you very much.